I would like to I would like to welcome you, Dr. Gottfried Spoyer, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you ever so much, Dr. Uh, Dr. Professor Rula Maria Dip, for having invited me and to everybody online for being with us today. I'd like to say that I feel I feel I feel deeply moved that um, my longest standing friends, David Silverstein and Susan Chasson, have been uh, joining us from California. Uh, not only so this is this is for you. This is dedicated to you, uh, not only because of nearly 44 years of friendship, but also, as you will see, uh, Abalonis play a central role in my presentation. And if it hadn't, if you hadn't shown me the way, David, I would never have found one. So thank you. And this is dedicated to the two of you. And thank you to everybody else for being with us. Thank you so much. The secret function of beauty. I feel the 14th century poet Hafiz speaking to our subject. Birds, this one second. Birds initially had no desire to fly. What really happened was this. God once sat close to them playing music. When he left, they missed him so much their great longing sprouted wings, needing to search the sky. Introduction. Just before the millennium, post-postmodernity began as an aesthetic movement. My talk is intended as a contribution to this newly emerging tradition. The term was coined, quote, to temper reason with faith and to witness the rebirth of utopia after its own death. Mod End of quote. Modernity and postmodernity reflecting, I believe, the events of possibly one of the darkest centuries ever. I'm critiquing our current culture that seems to be at war with beauty. Might it be possible to resurrect beauty and in the process contribute to healing the wounds of the past to embrace a brighter future. This can hardly happen if we continue to stare at darkness or continue to create it. I shall consider the mystery of beauty from evolutionary, psychosocial, philosophical, scientific and spiritual perspectives to arrive at its secret function. I'm not arguing for a regressive return to a golden age that never was. I'm not turning a blind eye to horrors past and present, but rather like Walter Benjamin's angel of history, I propose a wide eyes gaze, both fully facing the dark and in the now looking ahead with radical hope and confidence, certain that solutions will be found, even if as yet we cannot see them. I see beauty in contrast to Rilke's claim of it being, quote, nothing but the beginning of terror, end of quote, as the beginning of the numinous, a descent of the divine into matter thus discovering its central function in a plea for the re-enchantment as essential for survival, an aesthetic imperative. Dividing my presentation into four parts, I start with current takes on beauty. Then secondly, I consider the very beginnings of visual perception. And thirdly, look at the creation of beauty in mutuality to conclude with its healing function. Beauty today. Quote, 
We have grown up in an age that mistrusts beauty, filmmaker Edgar Reitz observed. Contemptuously, we speak of beauty as only skin deep. An exhibition some years ago was called the cult of beauty, as if alerting us to something sinister. Current obsession with physical beauty, youth and fitness is no contradiction to this, mostly resulting in soulless perfection that indeed is nothing but skin deep, although Botox is injected subcutaneously. Kleinian inspired approaches, emphasizing an assumed aesthetic conflict have but little to say about its solution. They seem more a reflection of the problem, further legitimizing and thus cementing it in our culture, fixated on the negative to an extent that is blind to the positive. Postmodernity, comments my colleague Dr. Birgit Hoyer, quote, gives us what could be called a sadomasochistic aesthetic as it conflates beauty and ugliness, just as sadomasochism conflates love and hate in presenting the one as the other, end of quote. To remedy this, Birgit has developed an outlook she calls deep positivity. Deep positivity is a complexity argued view of the world that situates love at the heart of reality and yet retains a capacity for embracing difficulty. C.G. Jung spoke of the revolutionary aspects of art and anonymously, the editorial of a women's magazine recently speaks of the transformative power of beauty. Is it this? that, quote, shakes us up and awakens us to new experience, possibly as frightening as it is enticing, end of quote. Is that the reason for conflict, terror? Somewhat more reservedly, Freud stated, quote, the enjoyment of beauty has a peculiar, mildly intoxicating quality of feeling, end of quote. Over a hundred years ago, when the sculptor Rodin addressed his testament to, quote, you who want to be priests of beauty, end of quote, modern art began with cubism, male artists depicting cut up female bodies. Duchamp's urinal followed before the end of the Great War, just a small step from there to David Hamilton's 2010, quote, shit and flowers, still lives with flowers and piles of feces. Art today seems a denial of love. It is a loveless culture determined to portray the human world as unlovable. And yet, throughout, beauty was tended to and attended in what I, found to, what I found to be the most surprising area, the realm of theoretical physicists. Einstein felt guided by, quote, mathematical beauty. And the theoretical physicist Paul Dirac elevated this idea to, quote, the principle of mathematical beauty. And he wrote, a kind of religion to me. In another poem, Hafiz speaks of wholeness, but I feel he might equally speak of beauty, which I have dared to insert here. So, beauty, I think, draws its life somewhere where the breathing stops, somewhere where the mind cradles light where only the senses remain, blush and stumble if they try to speak with our language so new, it is still trying to invent, 
still shaping its first intelligible sound, still sculpting its first true image of God. The birth of the eye. Let there be light, God proclaims. And we, all, and we may almost take the situation in the scripture as the experience, so to speak, of the earliest trilobites. Uh, this, this is a, a plastic model, and this is the real thing, a fossil. So these trilobites, some 500 million years ago, they were the first of our ancestor to develop eyes. But something else links them to the creation, to the creation myth. Quote, there is no record of complex life on earth before their time. It is as if in one instant in this time, complex multicellular life suddenly emerged almost intact on the planet. It's called the evolutionary Big Bang. There is a speculative theory that the emergence of the eye actually triggered this Big Bang." End of quote. Might we conceptualize the relationship between the eye and the varia variety to be perceived as dialectic, mutual? The capacity to see light and each other thus became the dawn of creation. Some 800 years ago, St. Francis of Assisi prayed, quote, Dear God, please reveal to us your sublime beauty that is everywhere, 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 so that we never again feel frightened. My divine love, my love, please let us touch your face. End of quote. In 1902, the anarchist Kropotkin proposed mutuality as a factor in evolution. The early psychoanalyst and anarchist Otto Gross transformed this into his basic assumption of mutuality in equality, not only for his clinical encounters, but for any relationship between two people, as well as in terms of the relating to oneself. Gross spoke of the goal of every revolution, and we may also understand this as radical change, is to replace the will to power with the will to relating. This possibly is his most important legacy. Quote, the highest goal of every revolution is to replace the will to power with the will to relating. Gross had a strong influence on Si Ji Jung, with whom he did the first documented, at times mutual, analysis. Kropotkin's mutuality, a term coined in the first half of the 19th century by the social anarchist Pierre Proudhon, is supported today by leading edge neurobiological research. Obviously, primitive organisms were already able to find each other to cooperate and procreate before the evolution of the eye. But the eye, added the basis for what, for what would become appreciation as an important element in mutual attraction. Beauty as a factor in evolution. Surprisingly, Darwin confirmed that the quote, the power to charm the female has sometimes been more important than the power to conquer other males in battle. End of quote. A pre-formulation of make love, not war. Yet earlier, Darwin wrote that looking at a P 
peacock's tail made him sick as it could not be explained as an adaptation for better survival. Ultimately, Darwin saw beauty as a factor in sexual selection. But in this reductive approach, beauty becomes functionalized, reduced to an indication for fitness. Most current attempts to explain the attraction between human beings also focus on links to fertility and genetic compatibility for the production of ever fitter offspring, excluding same-sex desires. So how is beauty born? The birth of beauty. The Roman poet Lucretius assumed that in order for us to be able to see them, objects shed skin-like particles thus sending out their own image. Until the 18th century, the phenomenon of the image's own inherent power has been understood with reference to God or another metaphysical force, matter as ensouled with a life of its own. In connection with the revolutionary art of Vladimir Tatlin, a Russian commentator in 1927 spoke of, quote, the free will of the object. Lacan states, quote, we are beings who are looked at in the spectacle of the world, end of quote. Clearly, this suggests that we can go as far as assuming the aforementioned mutuality also between what we still call subject and object, actually terms of non-relating with their respective meanings of subjugation and countering. Rula Maria Dipp quotes C.G. Jung on participation mystique, quote, this is Jung, it denotes a peculiar kind of psychological connection with objects and consists in the fact that the subject cannot clearly distinguish himself from the object, but is bound to it by a direct relationship which amounts to partial identity." End of quote. Some 800 years earlier, poetically, the Sufi Rumi expressed, quote, the eye has already made love with what it sees. Just like Jung in, understand, in his understanding of the dialectical reciprocity of relating, art historian Horst Bredekamp too postulates a mutuality between seer and seen, and thus regards both as equals. Is the birthplace of beauty in the transitional space between the seer and the seen? The theoretical physicist John Wheeler, quote, proposed to think of participants. We are designing the universe that does not even come into being until an, an observer is produced who can perceive it. Mind and matter acting as part of the same process, end of quote. With hidden beauty, like that of Burns that emerges only after death, or the patterns of wood grain that we can only see when we saw through a tree, this mysterious agency of the scene becomes ever more, ever more intriguing. Strahler in German, someone who radiates, who shines, is the term for those searching for crystals in the Alps. One of them likens such a discovery to a happy birth. Quote, I became aware that this crystal has waiting 12 to 15 million years in utter darkness to be salvaged, end of quote. And not so long ago, in an underground cave in Mexico, uh, a cave was discovered crisscrossed with crystals large enough for a person to work on, to work, to walk on. 
this cavern has an antechamber christened the queen's eye because of its resemblance to an eye. Quest for hidden beauty is one of my most frequent dreams themes. Every week, at least once, where the ocean meets the rocky shore, I go for abalone shells. As long as she's alive, nobody knows the secret of her beauty, not even she herself, I guess. The inside of her shell, where beauty reigns supreme. For me, it's the epitome of beauty, pure, sublime, is all. If I said functionally, it would not make a difference at all if the shells inside was a friendly, neutral gray, monotonous and dull. Could you really prove me wrong? So why this beauty? This shell holds the colors of the rainbow in all their hues and shades, iridescent, ever-changing, mother of pearl divine. Is this her secret? Like God's bow in the cloud, a token of a covenant between him and me? Could this be beauty's secret, this covenant, the abalone's gift to me and you and every living creature that has eyes to see? Tell everyone this secret then, enjoy. Just feel the pleasure as it radiates from the hidden chamber of her shell to give thanks with tears of joy. What makes the abalone so outstandingly special for me is that unlike, for example, the peacock's feather, there appears to be no discernible function whatsoever which one might ascribe to its beauty. It's pure beauty for beauty's sake. At the moment of relating, the luminous enters, the paradox of an active invocation of something that we can only surrender to for it to happen. The subtle body is created between you and me, just as between that which I see and myself. Approaching the other with Levinas, quote, to offer to find the trace of the face of God in the other, end of quote. Beauty is born in the holy, and as we recognize ourselves in the other, we become who we are. Hafiz again thus speaks to our hearts, know the true nature of your beloved. In his loving eyes, your every thought, word and movement is always beautiful. There was a turning point some hundred thousand years ago with the creation of drawings by our, by our ice age hunter forebears. A cave studio of earliest painters was found at an ocean cliff in South Africa, dating from over 50,000 years earlier than previously assu assumed for the earliest artworks. And photos show that the paint for these had been kept in abalone shells. Another source even speaks of 165,000 years ago, also with respect to South Africa. Yet these are unimaginable numbers. This hand axe, only 11 centimeters long, found in England, is to be supposed to be 400,000 years old. And what I feel to be important is it movingly seems to show a sense of beauty. A friend of mine speculates that the embedded fossil may also well have enhanced the power of the tool for the owner. Healing beauty. Today we can measure the damaging effect negative images have on our immune system. 
could the opposite be true too? Might beauty not just improve our health, but even heal? Beauty saves the world, writes Dostoevsky. The New York Times reported, artists, quote, artist says masterpieces can heal, writing about, quote, the art healing ministry, where people can be treated by means of an exposure to art for a variety of physical and psychological ailments, end of quote. Healing with or through beauty is an ancient concept surviving at the core of the North American Navajo ceremonies, where healing consists of restoring beauty, the natural state seen as part of one's identity. But in beauty I walk, with beauty before me and behind me, with beauty below and above, with beauty all around me I walk. Connecting us with the divine, beauty brings us into the here and now in an ecstasy that indeed is a standing outside of time and space, so that we experience our being as infinite in awakening to our essential immortal nature. Might this closeness of beauty with the religious be the key to its secret function? Otto Gross suggested, quote, it should be our task as psychoanalysts to heal not only the sexual complexes, but maybe even more the social and the religious ones to help the individual to re-experience the buried beauty of the world. Experiencing beauty, end of quote, experiencing beauty resembles Jung's later defining religion as, quote, the attitude peculiar to a consciousness changed by the experience of the numinosum, end of quote. Jung called, quote, the approach to the numinous, the real therapy, inasmuch as you attain to the numinous experiences, you are released from the curse of pathology. In English, beauty links with beatus, happy, in Latin. Beauty, the numinous healing love, can we imagine both a oneness of these four as well as simultaneously a mutual dialectic between them, where each enhances the other towards a single goal? And might epiphany, illumination, and revelation just be synonyms for ecstatic healing experiences that carry us to grow beyond ourselves? Could this then be the secret function of beauty? that it lovingly connects us both with ourselves as well as with each other and with the divine to allow the mystery of growth, life itself, healing to happen. For Khalil Gibran, quote, beauty is life when life unveils her holy face, end of quote. And with moving simplicity, a hadith states, Quote, God is beautiful and loves beauty. Accordingly, Rumi writes, for lovers, the only teaching is the beauty of the beloved. Conclusion. A contribution towards post-postmodernity, I have explored the secret function of beauty, emphasizing its revolution of the impossible of revolution. Having presented a critical reflection on our current culture crisis, cultural crisis, I've spoken about the birth of the eye and its implications, followed by reflections on perception and the birth of beauty. I have concluded by arguing for the healing function of beauty as an essential part of our fourfold dialectic unity that also includes the numinous and love. Quote, another world is not only possible, she is on her way, writes Arundhati Roy. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. 
Recalling Darwin's struggle with peacock feathers, let me end with the poem that I wrote, God's Loving Eyes. Violet eyes of deepest blue, each in a pool of copper-colored golden dust, and then surrounded by emerald green circles of more and ever more pure gold gazing at me with intensity deep into my very heart. From the tips of peacock feathers, whispering to me of the untold secrets of Persia, India, and all the Orient and Asia. Sultry climates languishing under a golden lazy sun, flooding with its amber light the whole world before it sinks beyond the orange red horizon. And now as night begins, Venus, the brightest star, throws diamonds by the handful across the inside of the roof of the never ending tent that stretches to the pearly gates of God's unearthly paradise. It is he who sends the peacocks and the abalones too as his holy messengers. We can look right into his eyes that gently stroke us with their loving gaze, that holds, envelops us in his embrace, giving us a taste of the eternal in the iridescent rainbow colors of the abalone's mother of pearl bowl, and in violet eyes of deepest blue, each in a pool of copper colored dust. Wow, thank you so much, Gottfried. That was indeed beautiful. Thank you so much. And uh, again, I would like to invite everyone to hear more of um, Dr. Hoyer's uh, poetry on the 27th, uh, the 27th of this month, where we will be launching the forthcoming issue of the Literary Journal in Yellowbo. Um, there are also many among us here who will be reading some poems. Uh, Carol will be reading poetry. Uh, Carol, you there? <laughs> uh, Hedy will also be reading some poems. And um, as well as many other great poets as well. And as uh, Dr. Hoyer said, uh, beauty will save the world. We need to keep producing beauty, sharing beauty, appreciating it and finding it everywhere it is. And it is everywhere. It's all around us. We just need to see it. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. That was great. Thank you. Um, and uh, if you would like to use the chat box for the questions, that would be good. And you could also just um, use the mic. So, Sarah, do you see any hands raised? I can't see any from my side here. Okay, I will start with a question. So, um, but Gottfried, you mentioned here um, many people who had their theories on beauty, and among them there was Dostoevsky, there was, uh, of course, Jung, and uh, uh, St. Francis of Assisi as well. Um, you also mentioned cubism, which, you know, the mathematical beauty and also the, the, the cutting of, of figures and bodies and all that. So do you think that the reason why beauty is perceived maybe in a more distorted way than it was before uh, is because people are tending towards, you know, this more mathematical or the logical way of thinking? I mean, we know Jung did not really appreciate Picasso's art, for example, um, nor did he appreciate uh, James Joyce's Ulysses, so anything that had fragmentation in it in the beginning, he rejected it. He felt that he, he needed to work toward it, toward appreciating this um, this new form of beauty. So, what do you what do you think about that? Thank you, thank you for your question. Uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm not a mathematician uh, myself, not at all. I feel kind of more of the opposite. So, as I was saying, it was a great surprise. It feels as if these, I mean, from, from the very little that I'm able to know about this whole field of theoretical physics and, and mathematics, uh, it feels that the, 
that these people engage deeply, deeply engaged with uh, with with this field, kind of it feels as as if they count as if they found beauty. I mean, similarly, I mean, there are quotations from Einstein, uh, if it's not over simplistically, to say that in his uh, work as a physicist, he found God. Or he he felt he met God, and in a similar sense, I think these people would have met beauty. I believe. Sorry, I was muted. But yeah, yes, um, that makes a lot of sense. Right. Um, there are so many other questions here. Thank you for your answer, Gottfried. Uh, we want to leave the floor now for the other questions. But Sarah, um, there's the the chat box question. Yes, but, um, there's just a quick one that says, could you spell the name of the 14th century poet you mentioned? Uh, I think I think that was St. Francis of Assisi. Uh -huh. OK. And then um, Susan Rowland asks, can there be beauty without love? What about the philosophical distinction between the sublime and the beautiful? I think I, think I do not make a distinction between the sublime and the beautiful. And... Uh, And I also believe, I mean, this is, it's, it's almost more a question of faith than an intellectual question. Uh, I do think that uh, I do see beauty and love to be connected indeed. Um, I think if I, well, if, if, if I, if I think of the extremes, so to speak, of, of what I would see as loveless beauty, beauty here in inverted commas, uh, <clears throat> like in the um, in, in in social realism and in uh, the uh, national socialism in, in in Nazi art, I do not feel that. They, they have any beauty that that re, that really speaks to me it, and I could say in connection with 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 the with the question and thank you for the question uh, it lacks the love these products lack lack love so it's uh, uh, it's more like, like like an ice cold beauty that as I say does 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 not speak to me I, I I find it hard to believe that that it convinces this kind of beauty. So this is uh, what you mentioned earlier, the, the denial of love or the portrayal of the world as unlovable. Uh, sorry, can you say that again, please? Yeah, so um, relating to what you said earlier, how um, I forgot who it was that commented on art nowadays as a denial of love, the portrayal of the world as unlovable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I could almost say, of course, of course, modern art is, 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 is yeah, it, it, it's, it's a huge field, but there does seem to be an emphasis on there does seem to be a greater emphasis on the ugly and that and that which which, which repels rather than on a, a a poetic enchantment the poetic enchantment of of of, of beauty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Of course, of course, of course, there, there, of course, there, there are there are wonderful exceptions. You, you, in fact, have been presenting wonderful exceptions. Uh, I mean, in 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 the last um, in, in 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 the May soirees, shall I say? Uh, uh, I was absolutely stunned by by some of the poems that that were uh, connected with uh, with with artworks. Uh, they were, yeah, absolutely wonderful and 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 deep, deeply moving. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, of course, there are so many exceptions. Um, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Rula, may I? May I? Yes, of course. Have the okay. word. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Doctor Gottfried, congratulations on your intriguing uh, and uh, penetrating uh, talk but i don't know why you you, you spoke of beauty and uh, utopia but i thought of uh, <laughs> ugliness and dystopia so I don't know why my my first thought was devoted to hg um, wells uh, scientific romances of the uh, 1890s no uh, where um, he uh, offers uh, still bleak uh, readings of uh, ugliness and uh, uh, struggle and degeneration within um, a vision of uh, global uh, entropy. Uh, I'm uh, referring to the island of Dr. Moreau. Sure, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know that. Well, yes, where Moreau's surgery um, creates uh, beast men who are certainly useful uh, for him, no? because they are able to speak, think, and um, institute laws, but they are terribly ugly. They're really ugly. So uh, when Prendick, who is the, um, one of the protagonists of, the sto of this story, um, uh, meets with one of them for the first time, he exclaims, color vanished from the world. So, and so this is the, the a, a way to uh, recall uh, also um, a phrase that I take from uh, Max Weber and uh, um, which is the disenchantment of the world, no? So Weber uh, spoke of the eclipse of uh, beauty, of magical, of uh, animistic uh, beliefs uh, um, uh, about uh, nature as part of the, the more general process of uh, um, rationalization. So, which is so as a, uh, a defining feature of modernity in, um, in the West. So do you think that it is to science that we have to uh, somehow um, give the, the, the fault of uh, such, a such a disenchantment? Uh, thank you very much for your question. Uh, uh, it, it makes me it makes me think on uh, of um, of uh, of Rula Maria's paper on uh, on on Jung and his relationship to um, to Joyce and to Picasso and uh, in that paper she quotes how Jung sees the art of I mean the writing of Joyce and the painting of Picasso very much as a reflection of the uh, of, of of the torn apart times in which they lived, and uh, I believe that the same is true for uh, for H. G. Wells, H. Uh, G. Wells, sorry, um, uh, whom you quoted, as well as Max Weber. I mean, as as a as a, as a sociologist. I mean yeah. that that those were those belong these people belong both in their philosophy as well as in their writings. I mean, it's, I guess they're about a hundred years old. And uh, mm -hmm. this is exa exactly as you say, they are defining parts of modernity. 
but uh, after modernity, uh, we have post-modernity, and uh, I am suggesting, I am arguing in my paper for a post-post-modernity where these things uh, do not do no, no longer play the role the role that they played in the past of reflecting the uh, the terrors of the last century, which, which I did mention. So a, a rebirth of beauty of uh, yes, 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 the sacral dimension of art. Thank you. Exactly. Yes, yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam, for the question and Gottfried. Uh, we have, do we have more questions in the chat box, Sarah? We have one more that just came through from Aaron. Okay. Um, the story or poem at the beginning linked longing with wing growth. Are you familiar with Plato's Phaedrus? In it, Socrates describes the soul of the lover awakening his memory by gazing on the beloved. This causes a painful regrowth of wings. No, I didn't know that. It feels lovely. Thank you ever so much. Thank you. It feels like a, uh, well, I think if, if, I, if I understood you correctly, what you read, you were speaking about a painful uh, regrowth of wings. I think Hafiz just speaks of wings sprouting uh, because mm. of of their longing, and um, uh, that that feels better to me. But then, mm -hmm. but then Hafiz is much later than Plato, of course. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you. Of course, I remember your poem from last, from the last time we met online. So, thank you, Rula, Maria. Yeah. I have a quick um, comment and question. I was um, reminded of the the difference between the East and the West as a view of beauty. And in Buddhism, there's the terrible beauty. There's Kali, that sort of energy of awakening. And um, and I was thinking about beauty and nostalgia. And that perhaps the, the movement in the West to sort of collapse enchantment was a first response to a sentimental kind of nostalgia. But that, you know, we are in need deeply of, you know, the, the ability to embody and respond to beauty, you know, as well as, you know, perceive ugliness for what it is. And, um, I guess I wondered if you could speak to the um, the idea of the differences in in the Western. I guess you know we're we're in the the scientific revolution that Descartes introduced. We we've that sort of um, broke broke the or you know introduced this body mind you know issue, and so this ability to deeply take in the perception of the be of beauty in the body has has been distrusted in some way it's sort of a complicated question i tend to do that and i i'm sorry <laughs> but i guess nostalgia you know is is a is a part of beauty it's a remembering and it can become memory enchanted memory and that perhaps we've needed to you know collectively um be able to remove ourselves from complete immersion, but also we also need to be able to immerse ourselves in beauty. Um, I'm anyway. <laughs> sorry. No, no. Thank, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, first, I'd like to say I find it I find it really interesting. I mean, I, I did I did quote. He, uh, I did quote Rilke at the beginning, who says, mm. "Oh, beauty is, is just just the beginning of terror." And, mm. uh, That's right. And, and I, I find it interesting. Uh, I gave a longer version of this talk before uh, at, at, at a university, and uh, 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 and the first question that came up was, "What about ugliness?" Mm. Uh, so I, I find it interesting that the talk kind of uh, triggers 
triggers the very opposite of what the subject is about. Um, I'm not quite sure about differences between East and West. I mean, when you speak about nostalgia, I did say that I was not, I'm not trying to argue for a golden age, right. for the return of a golden age that never was. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not someone who says, oh, uh, uh, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, or 1000 years ago, everything was much better than now. No. Uh, but I do believe that uh, we have we have a brighter, uh, more deeply felt future, even if we do not, even if we may not yet know the means to create this. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm certainly, I think I'm, I may have mentioned this at some point, or maybe just indirectly, I'm certainly with the contemporary spiritual teacher, Marian Williamson, who says, uh, we don't get into the light uh, by staring into the darkness. Mm -hmm. And that, that is something that I very strongly feel. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, which does not mean, certainly as an analyst uh, in, my, uh, in my clinical work, I'm, it certainly does not mean that I'm turning a blind eye to the traumas and terrors of well of the past and present uh, in the lives of the people that I'm working with, but I do keep uh, I, I I do I do keep that goal firmly in mind, uh, mm -hmm. like so just just an, as an, as as a very very small example, uh, uh, many people. Uh, who I work with, uh, when they present a dream, usually their first thought is, oh, it, pro it probably means something terrible. And mm -hmm. I say, no, you can look at it in a really different way, that, that, that it's actually a help. And, and it, 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 it helps you to grow. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. in a way, that's, so that's what I do, and that's what I feel and believe in. And that connects to that idea of the sublime, that it, that uncanny, that something that doesn't easily fit. I think that's what you might be referring to in a way. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I, I am not, uh, yes, th thank, thank you very much for, for mentioning this. I am not, um, how shall I put it? I'm not, I'm, I, I am fully aware that beauty can shock and take me aback. Yeah. But I do not. I do not perceive that as terror. Right. Aesthetic arrest. Uh, yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, it, it, I mean, I can. I mean, off the top of the uh, personally, I feel like saying I certainly know moments. Can remember moments where I feel really, sorry for want of a better word hit by beauty but it mm -hmm. is a yes uh, it is it is a deep it is a deep and profound pleasure rather than rather than a reaction to terror i mean reacting to terror is is like <laughs> trying trying to keep it away from me and uh with beauty that's different if, mm -hmm. even if it does take me aback Arrestedness is, is, is a wonderful term in this context. Thank you for your talk today. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Thanks. Thank could, I say, you. could I say something? Yeah. Yes. Hi. Hi, Gottfried. It's Linda Mary here. Lovely to see you. <laughs> I really enjoyed your talk very, very much. And I love the, the whole thing about beauty. I love it. However, I wanted to add, um, do you know the work of Mark Quinn, the sculptor? Yes. Because I went to see an exhibition of his in the Liverpool Tate and I was very moved by it because he took things that are not traditionally regarded as beautiful, such as disability, you know, people who were affected by thalidomide with missing limbs and so on. 
and um, uh, he made something beautiful out of what is not traditionally regarded as beautiful. And I wondered if you had sure. any comment comment on that. I think I, I think I, I think I know his work. I, I felt moved that there, there is a uh, there is a very naturalistic. Um, uh, sculpture of of a man lying on his side, but it's it's he is he is uh, not 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 act not natural size, but everything else is natural. And I think he's it's called Father, and he is all he also is is it the same one who also has uh, um, his head uh, in 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 form of blood in the form of blood. Uh, he he sculpted a baby's head out of his yeah. wife's placenta and and put that in a kind of case which has to be kept at a certain temperature you know to preserve yeah. it yeah. Yeah. but that was having lost babies myself you know before before full term that was so moving to me because nobody ever sees you know the baby that doesn't come to full term and he gave it a sort of an existence and it was very beautiful actually I can see that. Yes, thank, thank you very much. Yes, yes, and also thank you for coming. <laughs> I wouldn't have missed it. <laughs> hey, thank you, everybody, for the wonderful questions and some comments. And there still are uh, lots of comments in the chat box. Um, However, we could try to leave them for later because uh, we would like to go now for the, uh, for the poetry and uh, an art series. But first of all, I want to thank you so much again, Dr. Hoyer, for this wonderful, wonderful presentation and for all the time that you've given everyone for the questions. Uh, unfortunately, we won't be able to take them all now, but we can leave them until the end of the, the session. And uh, uh, thank you ever so much again for having for having me. Uh, is 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 it also for those for those who may have questions? Is is my email address available somewhere? Uh, yes, I will. I will post your email address yeah. now in the chat box. Yeah, yeah, okay. that, that, that yes, would be lovely. Would be so I'm, I'm 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 happy to. Also, I mean, if we don't have time, if we don't have enough time today, tonight, this morning, whatever. Uh, <laughs> I'm also, of course, I'm happy to respond to emails. And thank you ever so much again, Rula Maria. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful, wonderful talk. Thank you. So uh, next up, we will start with the poetry. We will alternate between poetry and painting. So uh, first, Professor Claude Barbary. Yes. Well, good afternoon from Chicago. Um, uh, let's see, I'll get the screen. Uh, can everyone see the poem? Yep. Okay. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, I'm going to read, uh, re we'll read two poems. Uh, the first poem is, uh, uh, was written in the midst of the, uh, the, the raging pandemic uh, last year in November. Uh, it's, it's an elegy. Uh, and the second poem is really with the opening up, it's, it's uh, the imagination of travel. Uh, so I, I paired the two together. This first poem uh, is entitled November Memoriam. Countries of the body count become our home. Alluvial death undresses in its lair. Mouse shadows bed against the early moon, and winters past that fell the elder elms now fall again in mind with every leaf. Jarred in June, the garnet cherries turn to intimations of a murray dusk when vesper light extinguishes its lamps and seals the flame. We take our rest and rounds. North is true, but only by a star that melts like snow upon the cirrus main. A roan curvets and leaps the paddock fence to graze and eye an Appaloosa sky, the palimpsest of autumn burned to gray. 
gone the swallow's woven art of air. Mnemonic shadows ten from every tree and mark without summation or despair the dying day that strengthens to depart. Go, the stillness says, and go by way the storms will come from rails of dragon bones that break in margins of the ancient maps, the wilds of glacial boreas, the isles of frozen mist and spray, our spirit goes. But how to live, the stillness will not say. It lingers on the lips that lose their words and draws a single breath to speak your name. Beautiful. And then the, the second poem I read is, is um, as Godfrey was talking about, these are really rather moments of numinosity in terms of the imagination. Um, this is my imagining being able to move out of quarantine uh, and, and into the, uh, the world of Costa Rica. A slice of mango like an irised toucan beak, a scarlet ibis bill incurved to pierce the hushed sword silver glint of shoals. The distant lightning flash, the serpent God appeased, called from forgotten stone, his thunder lost beneath the falling sea on shore. Resplendent Quetzal plume, headdress of spirit fire that sweeps the morning star, is born from forest rain, conceived by emeralds. The yellow elders craze, the hermit hummingbirds who sound like wind through conchs, unnumbered flutter counts that fill each wake with gems. Each trodden ox cart road is eyelash viper round where mountain coffee grows and faint meringue blends to cheeps of Capuchin. A jaguar's dark rosettes among the silhouettes of broadleaf evergreens comport with stalking stairs as tapers wade in mud. The jungle leans to lunge into cacao groves where painted girds ostend the crimson amaranth and orchid parrot wings, the tales of afterlife where hairless skeletal canines creep with odds of Seba shade and vice water caves of jade. Volcanoes sleep inside magenta chili seeds as mauve camitos weep from freshened jorum brinks when chilled sangria pours. Blue morpho butterflies with topaz necklaces who sip the caiman tears, dissolve into a sky of Aztec gold and blood. The onyx curacos in cerements of palm disperse the spinal clouds that evanesce in lime and phantom canopies. All night, the howlers keen from Guanacasta boughs and bid Ceres half light to ripen reaching east until the storms arrive. Thank you for the gorgeous poetry, Thank you. So rich with imagery and sound. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure hearing your wonderful poems. Thank you. And uh, next, we will move to some art with Rachel. Rachel, are you ready? All right, so 
Hello, everyone. Yeah, I just need to um, just select the images. Bear uh -huh. with me. All right, take your time. Right, okay. So uh, my name's Rachel, I'm an artist and I live in Wales in the UK. And um, I began uh, my practice as an artist at Chelsea Art College in the 90s. And um, I was mainly working with photography and the sort of painterly qualities of photography, uh, installations. And then I discovered Jung and I started to paint. Um, I became interested in his use of mandalas and as a psychological containing um, form and a way to experiment with color and texture and things. And so um, after painting quite a lot of mandalas and reading a lot of Jung, I then moved on to squares because um, I was told that if I used mandalas, it would be perceived as quite new age and, you know, which wasn't my primary concern with it. I was also quite interested in um, Christine Mann's painting as well, which are in Archetypes in the Collective Unconscious and her use of uh, painting and, and Jung's narrative about her individuation. Um, so I call myself a Jungian artist because really um, things really changed when I discovered Jung. So, um, so yeah, my main three modes of inquiry are painting, collage and photography, but less, less so photography at the moment. So that, that's just a bit of context. Um, next, I'm going to talk about a recent commission. Oh, actually, um, this is another uh, squares painting that I sold a couple of years ago. Um, I had an exhibition where I showed these paintings. These, this is called Rain and it's a diptych. And I was quite interested in the light reflecting qualities um, over and above the, the sort of mindfulness as well was something that I was quite interested in with the painting and repetition. That's, that's something I'm still working on. Um, and so these are the paintings in a, in a small gallery just where I live here in Cardigan. Um, and so that that's those. And um, so the next thing was a commission that my close friend here, Sean, asked me to to create an image um, about his land. Um, he had a house up here above the sea in a place called Cumrice Head. And he was he's he's very interested in nature and rewilding and very ecological, quite different for me. I'm a Londoner. Um, quite urban sort of person so it was a kind of quite an alchemical kind of mixing and um, so I went around his property and I took lots of pictures um, and these are his dogs Arthur and August who are particularly lovely and uh, uh, and I, because I'm quite interested in the painterly, painterly qualities of photography I kind of got quite interested in in drawing with light around his property, but um, this wasn't this wasn't enough for him. He didn't feel that this was reflecting enough of his beliefs and him and and stuff like that. So, um, so then I got him to give me a bunch of his pictures and some of these. This was one of his photographs. So I said, "Well, look," and and also he gave me some poetry. He's a poet. And um, I started messing about with text and images, spiritual images, um, found images. And he was he's he's had a, a caravan painted this color on, on his land. So um, this was a picture of him that he gave me that he'd taken and also him holding flowers here. So this is where the picture that we both came up with together started to emerge. Um, and this is the final result. Um, there's lots of text there about snakes and roses and wild roses and insect life and some lines from his poems and Arthur and August are just about visible in the back there and the sacred lamb, the mystic lamb from the Gwent altarpiece. So that, that was the commission as it finished. 
Um, and then currently I've been drawing with my eyes closed. Um, this one is a kind of, uh, and then working them through in my computer. Um, so I did a series of those um, drawing my eyes closed around objects. So sort of um, found form, the, the structure a bit, you know, there's some mandala shapes in here, but even, even just, you know, using here, I, I selected everything in, in my room with the colour blue and drew around that and um, with my eyes closed and then opened my eyes and worked on it in my iPad. Um, and then I so I've got um, I've got two pictures about to be shown in the gallery in London. This is one of them, and this is makeup and tea lights, and um, these are things on my side table. Um, and again, I'm interested in quite the light reflecting and luminous kind of bringing out bringing out that that with with the objects. And here is a final piece that I've been working on on my laptop um, on my iPad rather. Um, yeah, so that, that's a, a recent piece. So that's it. It's the end of my talk. <laughs> wow, that was lovely. I wonder how it's like drawing with your eyes closed. Yeah, it's, it's good. It's good. It's, I, um, I got this idea from an artist that I've been researching called Sam Winston, who, who spent a month working in the dark and did mm -hmm. lots of drawings and, and a whole kind of project around that. And so that was what that was what sparked off the practice. And it's quite good. It's sort of, yeah, like a metaphor for the unconscious and mm -hmm. uh, it, it sort of disables the visual sense. So you get quite a quite an interesting effect through that. Yeah, and, and there's always this element of surprise that only you're surprising yourself. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And you, you get that element of surprise with photography as well, and particularly the old format where you would take pictures and have them developed and you never knew quite what was going to emerge. And I think, again, that's another sort of metaphor for working with the unconscious and, and limiting skill in a sense as well, where you're not so controlled over, over the outcome of what, what, what you're going to produce. So, you're, yeah, you're learning and being surprised as you work is, makes it interesting. Wow, thank you so much for sharing. No problem, uh, thank, thanks for the invitation. The we'd love to see the paintings live one day. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I want to carry on with the squares actually, because I, mm -hmm. I quite enjoy that process. It is quite a meditation and, and quite relaxing, you know. Wow, that's beautiful. Thank you so much, Rachel. No problem, thanks for asking me. Thanks, and uh, Glenda. Are you here? Yes, I see you, Glenda. All right, so Glenda will be sharing some poetry. Mm -hmm. yeah. And okay. Glenda, you're joining us from Ireland, right? That's right, from Dublin. Mm -hmm. um, the first one I'm going to read is about a waterfall in Spain. And it's about, for me, it's beauty. The Iris Waterfall. For centuries you have been, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. For yeah. centuries you have been throwing yourself down this mossy chasm into the green blue river you have carved through this valley to carry you. How long does it take a drop of water to travel from river to precipice? Your flow is free, yet caught in infinite return. You are not trapped in body limitation. You follow your path with force and direction, yet you are always in the same place. Can we see our lives in yours? If you could speak to us beyond the barricades of language, what would you tell us? You change the cliffs as you journey, yet keep your place and your constancy. So we travel and go nowhere. So we change and stay the same. In and out of the waterfall, the light sparkles. In and out of the waterfall, fly a hundred birds. And um, a second poem is about making art, really, um, based on a dream. Let's see if I can just find it here quickly. This is... Um, the problem with not having things printed out beforehand. It's called Fragile Dream and I wrote it for Philip Casey, um, a late poet and novelist from Dublin. He offered me a love angle made of glass, a broken piece of a larger glass object. Its beauty nearly brought me to tears. I confessed to him how tired I was of being lonely. He showed me a beautiful glass ship, a mobile someone had made from other broken pieces. I admired it all the time wondering why others could make art of all their broken pieces and I could not. 
And as I say, that was a dream. Um, wow. I'd like one on um, implicate orders or have inspired by my non-physical physicist definition, understanding of um, Bohm. Reflection on implicate order. This is the life I have led or the life that led me. Is it the life I chose or the life that chose me? Did I exercise free will or follow my destiny? This Cohen could give me dementia, but was my life there in potentia with all that has been or will exist from the second that flower was kissed by some unimaginable bee whose love set the universe free? Um, will I read another or is that? Yes, you can, of course. Okay, um, let me find one that's maybe, yeah, I think I'll read one which to me is about not beauty. It's about Mark Rothko. It's not actually an ekphrastic poem, but it's about art. And to me, I feel that his life was sad, that he was full of angst and went in the wrong direction, but that's me. Anyway, um, I start with a quote from him. A picture lives by companionship, expanding and quickening in the eyes of the sensitive observer. It dies by the same token. It is therefore a risky and unfeeling act to send it out into the world. And the poem starts. His paintings were his children the offspring of his mind, not his now impotent body. He wanted to keep them together like siblings. He struggled to protect them from separation, from being bought and sold in the end to the highest bidder. Once a woman visited his studio wanting a happy painting with warm colors, Rothko retorted, red, yellow, orange, aren't those the colors of an inferno? His suicide left his paintings like his 19 year old daughter and six-year-old son without a father. He died as he painted in his studio, barbiturates taken, arteries cut, white long johns, black socks, framed as he lay on the floor by red, his lifeblood. Meaning of it all, purpose, there was no suicide note. Silence is so accurate. His art was not about color relationships. He wanted to express tragedy and doom. The painting was the experience. To those who think of my pictures as serene, he said he would like to say, I have imprisoned the most utter violence in every inch of their surface. In 2012, Rothko's 1961 painting, Orange, Red, Yellow, was sold by Christie's in New York for 86 million, setting a new record at public auction for a post-war painting. Okay, um, will I read one more about love, maybe? Just, it's not too long. Yeah, um, still have until the end of the five minutes. Oh, still not there yet. Okay, good. Um, yeah, this one is called, ah, sorry. Oh, Glenda, you may want to put the titles of your collections in the chat box. Nobody will ever find these, they're out of print. Oh, okay. But, um, I will, uh, I will, uh, you can Google me and you'll find poems. This is called The Light from Dead Stars. And of course, it's about the loss of love and, the, and how love continues on no matter what. Last night, I lay on my side of the bed, your side of the bed, empty and cold, while the open fire sent shards of light across the ceiling sky, like distant galaxies of shining dust. And the iridescent stars you hung for me when you loved me glowed all night. I felt myself drifting, drifting away from the stars to the outer reaches of the universe, through the impossible vastness of space, to the edges of entropy, slowly spinning in vertiginous freefall without you forever. Guided only by the ever dimming light of your once bright love, shining for me still like a dead star in the darkness. And um, maybe one other short poem about loss. This is the hard part. This is the hard part. Lying here, the empty house in the dark, listening in spite of myself for your footstep on the stair. My head says you will not come. My heart hears you everywhere. Catches each time the wind thumps the plastic on the window we didn't repair. Time turns hope to despair. No arms around me. Cold night surrounds me. No love to ground me. I drown in air. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much, Glenda.
things done. So much soul in your work. Thank you. And uh, now for a taste of ekphrasis from music to painting, from painting to poetry, and a little bit of art space research. So, uh, Neil and Aisha, are you ready? Yes, we are. Thank you. Okay. Hello, Neil and Aisha. Um, both are joining us from Turkey today. Yes, we are. And it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting us. Uh, there were some very inspirational talks and lovely poetry. Uh, and I'm very honored to be able to present our work to this distinguished crowd tonight. So I'll share my screen if it's okay. And now I will start. Mm -hmm. So the title of our presentation tonight is Transformation of Music into a Painting and Poems by a Poetic and Artographic Inquiry. And <clears throat> my co and the artist who inspired me is Aisha Güler. Uh, and I'm glad to be sharing our work tonight with you all. Uh, Art-based research, as you all know, has been uh, popular and it's starting to spread out uh, and it's being used for deriving artistic data and then using in research. And I, as an academician and researcher, am uh, involved in poetic inquiry and I use it as a way of knowing through poetic language and devices, metaphor, lyric, rhythm, and all of the poetic devices that we use. So uh, these representations can provide the researcher and uh, the observer with a different perspective. And with this perspective, we look at the same scenario with a different uh, sense, with a different understanding, with the intuition, if you will. So, uh, let me share with you how our uh, study actually started out. I went to visit Aisha uh, at her university and uh, she's an instructor of fine arts. And I had the pleasure of attending her atelier practices and lessons. So I met the artist and I observed her while she was teaching her students and also performing to music. So I was inspired from an artwork uh, and the artwork itself was inspired from music. So it was kind of like a catalyst and we were, uh, you know, getting inspiration from music and from painting. And then the result was poems, poetry. Uh, and uh, these of course resulted in my inquiring into the paintings she made with the use of my poems, which came spontaneously uh, and uh, they were the means of deriving data and getting more introspective into her paintings. So as she was painting guided by the music, I shall be sharing the videos shortly with you. Uh, she began to interpret the figures and the colors. And then of course, uh, as you can see, this is her painting in class. Uh, and you can see how she's enraptured with what she's doing. Her soul is there and uh, in the, pre the previous presenter uh, was talking about how the artist was not there anymore and the artwork itself was present. This is exactly uh, a live presentation of what she was referring to with uh, <clears throat> the poetry uh, that she read also. Uh, and so you can see that uh, this is a seven meter long paper and she has been painting on it. Uh, so let me share with you the videos and the music. So she's using her hands, the paint, and water, which is also a live element. She'll be scattering it on the painting. And the painting came to life, literally. Uh, and uh, I could see how it became, it was like a life component which actually drew me right into the painting, inspiring me to uh, write poems to, to express how I felt about the painting and what the painting was also saying to me. It was like a translation, a verbal presentation of the painting and the music because they became one. Of the 
damage for that how she's scattering water, how every, her whole body is involved in it. The feet, the arms, everything, the hands, the paint. She became one with all the materials and everything else that she's using. The music is obviously guiding her. And this was a sublime piece of work because it was extremely time for me. This is how you can use artist research and post required to actually produce uh, an academic research paper uh, from such artwork. So it's kind of like a two-way process. I shall be reading to you my poem momentarily. Wait, so yeah. Why can't I do the first? Ha, here we go. So as you can see, I was watching her perform and the poetry that came, uh, I tried to do justice to her painting. I hope I could. I shall be reading to you. Uh, wait, ha, here it is. So this is a finished painting, of course, a miniature version. And this is one of the poems that I wrote to it. Do you know what the drunkenness of the sea is? While you melt into the depths of the endless blues, as the foam on the surface imprisons the light, those waves come to life with the wisdom within them. Then dissolve one must in that essence of the sea. Blue ink, the sea, the scribe of the skies. Whoever sees the pen inscribing away will get the essence of wisdom from what is written. So actually, I'd like to read another poem which describes a little bit more her uh, process. And I shall be sharing another screen with you in one second, sorry. Why is this? Ah, here it is, one second. Let me get that also. There. Thank you for your patience. Here we go. So because this is exactly, I thought that it was uh, so much better to express how I felt she was actually interacting with the music. When music invades your soul and it commands your heart, your brush becomes a pen that the magnificence will write. All the stars of the universe trickle into the notes. Those notes in turn drip into color shell. Thus the melody of the music, the harmony of colors becomes as the details in your soul vibrate inside. Also, this is another one which describes her process. As the blue of the skies pours on the paper with all the secrets of symbols and patterns, all the wisdom of the universe is embodied in this artwork. After all, the music is in the foundation of it. That sacred inspiration is always with you. Then surrender yourself. Let there be none of you in it. Be the sifter of the skies. Flow down from the colors, ooze down the brush, get past the paper, pour right into the art piece. So, these three, there were more poems, but we, of course, uh, we had to choose some of them. Uh, so they are demonstrative of how actually uh, poetic inquiry can be very instrumental in uh, reflecting what you can derive from an artwork and how art based research can be used to express how you interact with the artwork and how you can transform the artwork into another artwork per se. In this case, actually, uh, the music, which was of course sound, was transformed into colors and symbols, which then became painting. And then I was inspired to verbalize what the painting was saying. And then of course, another translation, if you will, occurred. And uh, the painting started to speak through my pen. So it was like a three-way process and I wanted to share this with you. Uh, Aisha, would you like to say something about your work? Yes, uh, you are an amazing poet, you know, uh, and uh, I love your poems uh, very much. It's a, a very amazing experience for me. Uh, I am um, painting music uh, for 10 years. I started with George Gershwin, but not. I am not only listen and painted. I want to uh, embody the music sound to use my body and my soul because sound is very abstract. And I'm a painter, 
and it's very uh, not abstract it's on your in front of you on paper on surface it's very difficult to transform it um but it's an amazing experience thank you uh, for your listening thank you Thank you so much. I mean, this is gorgeous. And it's amazing. I mean, you just demonstrated how inspiration is the best teacher, hence arts-based research. So thank you so much for sharing, Neil and Aisha. Um, next, uh, we have Carol. Carol? Hello. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Rula. I'll just uh, share my screen. And I have two poems. Uh, they're not too long, uh, should take around about five minutes or a little, little more possibly. Um, the first poem, uh, I was um, downtown LA uh, waiting for jury duty and um, thinking about working on my, actually my dissertation at the time and thinking a lot about imagination and um, embodiment and memory. And uh, so this is the poem that I um, that came to me while I was um, downtown. It's called Eurydice in the City. Above a square green patch of grass stands a gridded modern monolith, housing laws, the spectrum of data, designed to free the innocent or to capture those who gird themselves against any rule, those who breach the order of design. Pigeons walk the gray path that lines the living center place where plantings mark this ancient land. People also walk and linger here, crisscrossing the space between the blocks of buildings. I wonder if the ghosts of animals or Indians float anywhere nearby, or if the land has forgotten them as well. I wonder about this forgetting, or if beneath the built world, this brittle world, something abides from the past. Eurydice is surely wandering in some dark place, stung and spilling. Ancient bones and stones lay buried beneath the surface of this place, still in darkness. The wind enters here as always, though the sounds have changed. A bus passes with the rush of engines, then suddenly the squeal of metal brakes. Someone laughs. Perhaps the sea is red. The metal benches here are bubblegum pink. The blue sky overhead is empty. I easily forget about this opening into the infinite that is always encircling the weight of things. The red pulse of metro buses stream to and fro. A helicopter sounds with sputterings of whir. Flags wave on poles, the world represented in the warp and woof of threads. A delicate gray shadow patterns the grass beneath a small straight tree, empty of leaves. Buds line the branches, whoops, sorry. <laughs> Buds lie, line the branches like dark beads. The day is full here, but it is also empty. This inner city park is a square of green grass cut out from within another square, a gray concrete slab where a coyote once roamed. Rattlesnakes slithered, horses ran, a cow grazed, automobiles streamed by to the north. Sirens sound while clouds now form and drift. This region of waiting, of nearness, of distance. I'm listening for Orpheus here and wonder when I see someone lift their arm in a wave to a stranger, if Eurydice is also now listening to this red sea of sound and change. Like an ambient scent, the square is filled with movement, with my meditation, voices undying and tender. Someone whispered to me, are here. The late hour might be an eternal noon. The sweetness of the willow branch is thankfully remembered. Each small black window is a pool of shimmering onyx. This place is an exploding coral of gray tangle and also perhaps a most hidden Pyrian spring. And um, I've got a couple of snippets from uh, Heidegger and uh, Rilke there. So it's got some intertextual elements. And then the other poem <clears throat> is also intertextual and it's very short. It's called Still Life. <clears throat> I'm, I get so nervous reading. Anyway, um, it is time for the cutting to slowly start to heal, she said, as the changing light casts shadows here for long and long. 
giving the green heath where sunflowers bloom bright, patience that is also quiet, resting in innocence, resting with intanta mansadeo, a gentle aimlessness that is at once never aimless. It is a lighter way to exist that is also like listening, that is like Mirandi's vessels huddled together as if underwater, submerged, liquid infused with memory, giving heart to sight. I am attention, I am body looking out the window, she said, while the unworldly, the celestial, the airborne, the burning always is, always passes, as I collect happiness with mimosa. Its flower, leaf, bark, seed, roots, its sound, scenting this place of stillness and life, where the cutting time makes way for this place of breath. And uh, this one drew from uh, Assay Berg's with Deer, um, Clarice Lesbector, Les, Les, Lispector, sorry, Tanta Macedeo, and from Helene Sisu. So that's all. Yeah. Wow. Gorgeous as always, uh, Carol. Thank you so much. For the Thanks for the opportunity to read. Beautiful, beautiful poetry. Thank you. Thank you. And now, uh, Aaron. Aaron, you there? Hello, yes. Yeah, there you are. Okay, hi. So Aaron will be sharing a couple of poems with us tonight as well. Aaron, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, I have um, two poems and an image. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, I wanted to acknowledge um, those who were killed five years ago at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida. Everything is colonized. She misses you, says the dream figure. Falling, fainting, I worry. Life's direction rarely singular, no path is many. Lost in layers, I cry out. She watches, listens, but speaks silently. Echo chamber, atom smasher. Holy cities in dust, in bones, in oily mayhem. Entrenched in mud, tears, blood. Sacred spilling, drying. This is not a mantra. She misses me, but I ride numb. Goddess of transgender warriors, crafter of oldest technology, protects what she lost long ago. Her embrace strangles at the sight of spears. Still, I enter her chamber willfully unconscious of consequence. Her fiery blizzard kiss pelts us with possibility. A message from planet's aching core, return. So the second one, uh, I'll start with an image if I can get it to show. Uh, can everyone see that? Uh, yeah. Okay, so this is uh, George Harris, uh, who, after that first photo on the top was taken, moved to San Francisco, uh, took quite a bit of LSD, uh, renamed themselves Hibiscus, and co-founded a theater company called the Coquettes. Um, so the second poem is for them. Um, it's a bit longer. This is called For Hibiscus and Daisy. Hundreds of years before Persephone was born of people's tongues and minds, she was underworld queen, Inanna, sister to Gilgamesh, Gil and Enkidu, my queer fantasy. Inanna, you fertilized in my whole grad school cohort, images of threatening storm clouds, dark. Yet abundant crops are unimaginable without the rain, sky bleeding into soil. 
you called upon your brother, the God King, to evict Lilith from the Hulupu tree. I thought a goddess needs tools to build her home among branches and bark. Lilith became my proto-lesbian, fashioning the phallus with smooth lines, the peg that allowed holy her to penetrate Adam. This is how Great Mother got inside. Inside every living phallus is a tube, a channel for half sets of DNA. This is why Inanna, when you came to me, I saw an ancient war cannon covered in moss. In my fem first universe, Adam only came first because men wrote him that way. We queenly others have always been here. We did not need the pen or, or record keeping. We wove ourselves into ears and hearts through song, fireside story, chanting the names of all who came before. Motherhood is primal of eternals. Patriarchy was planned. Take me back, goddess. Drag me through sorcery strewn reeds. Pluck my strings so I vibrate your message. Honor her. And I say always, praise thee, Inanna, the rain song of all sleepy seeds, the moss inside my cannon. Thank you so much, Aaron. We still have another poem, right? Uh, oops, I lost you all. Oh, I gotta stop. There we go. Yeah. Uh, the, just those two. Thank you so much. That was marvelous. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. And I also want to thank everybody for being here tonight uh, or this morning. And um, I mean, this is this is the time. Of, you know, this is the, the activity that I greatly look forward to. Uh, we meet new people every time and we also see so many familiar faces. And the best thing about it is that we meet through creativity and um, it's just wonderful. Thank you so much for being here and for sharing your work. Uh, next site creative session will be on the 17th of July. And uh, we have not confirmed the introductory speaker yet, but it will be confirmed within the next week or so. Um, but again, thank you once more. We still have three more uh, literary and art uh, events this month. They're not for site creative per se, but there are many presenters who do present in site creative that would also be presenting uh, this month. We have the launch of the forthcoming issue of Indelible, which I had mentioned earlier in the session. This will be on the 26th and 27th of June. Uh, on the 22nd, we have Jasper Ford visiting and talking about fantasy writing. So if anyone is interested um, and for some more updates, you could follow Facebook. There's Site Creative, obviously, on Facebook, and there's Indelible Literary and Arts Journal. Uh, there's also an Instagram page and a Twitter page. So if you would like to see more art and listen to more poetry, that is not just for site creators, um, please feel free to tune in. And uh, again, it was lovely seeing you all and hearing all the wonderful things you had to say. So until we meet again next month, everybody take care and stay safe. Bye. Thank you very much. So much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Wonderful. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everyone.